Now, this is what is now known as a tunic cross. The idea was that 2,000 years ago, before the Lord Jesus Christ went back to Jerusalem, destined to die on the Roman gibbet, the Roman cross, that as a boy, he came to visit southwest England, and particularly Cornwall. And here we are in Lisgard. Now how remarkable that the Lisgard Authority should choose this symbol for the 2,000 years of the Christian faith. And we have here what we call a tunic cross. That is the boy Jesus, before he took his bar mitzvah on his 13th birthday, he is here depicted as a boy, not as the Jesus we know generally at 33 years of age being crucified. No, this is not a crucifix. This is the boy Jesus. And how do we know that? Because he is wearing a tunic cross, a tunic garment, it's called a tunic cross. You'll notice that he has a tunic down to just above his knees. And that signified he had not taken his bar mitzvah and he hadn't taken his vows as a senior, as a junior adult, if I can use that term. And uh, he came with Joseph of Arimathea. Now, how many times and at what age, we've not got a record of that. But we certainly have a record of his coming here with Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph of Arimathea was his great uncle, and he's not to be confused with the Joseph who married the Virgin Mary. This is the great uncle of Jesus Christ. Now the wonderful thing about that connection was that Joseph of Arimathea had a brother called Joachim. Joachim married Anne, and Anne came from Gaul, and her town or village is still there in Brittany, and that's where she came from. And she married Joachim, and Joachim and Anne uh, became the parents of the Virgin Mary, and of course the Virgin Mary gave birth to Jesus. So uh, Anne and Joachim were indeed the grandparents of Jesus. So Jesus' grandmother was Anne, who came from Gaul, so she was a Celt. So our quite Christ's wonderful connection with the Celt people, or the Celt company, uh, occurs, and this is one of the products of that relationship. That the boy Jesus came to Cornwall, and these tunic crosses appeared where he was seen as a child as a boy before he was 13 years of age. Again, it's called a tunic cross. And you'll have to contact me if you want more details. But as far as I know, there was only one of these crosses discovered. And uh, that uh, was linked with the Truro Cathedral and they produced uh, an alabaster reduced copy of this, which I have in my possession. So we thank God that Jesus came probably because of his connections with his grandmother in Gaul. And of course it was not far away. We call that Brittany today. So it's a wonderful story. This is one of the evidences that the boy Jesus came to England. I've been remonstrating with someone who believes that when we die, that's the end of it. So I suggested that he should read the last chapters of the Gospels and the first chapters of the book of Acts. And what was wrong 
been before enough to have believed what somebody said, and then it didn't happen, and then you gave your life for the nonsense. <laughs> of course it's not true. They say, of course it's not true. There's nothing beyond that. Could we pray for him? I said to him that the devil had got hold of him. <laughs> <laughs> and then he needed to ask God. And God is, I think, really willing to do this. Ask God to prove himself to him. <clears throat> and I'm so glad to say that he said, all right, I will do that. Could we pray for him? Who's going to pray for him? That God will indeed show him. He's someone who has heard the gospel from his relations. I, I, I prayed for my husband for 17 months. Yes, well, would you like to pray for him now? Yes. And for, for, for this man who is in it such need. It is up to your wife to intercede for him, you know. Mm. To pray continually and never stop. Mm. Mm. Well, would you like to, to lead us in prayer now? Yes. 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 Father, I pray for this man. I pray for that you soften his heart, that you replace his heart, heart and you put a heart of flesh, Lord, where your Holy Spirit can abide. Touch him by your Holy Spirit, wherever he is right now, Lord. Move into his life. You said that you pour out your spirit over all flesh yes. in the latter days. Yes. So Lord, we claim that you move into his life mightily. Yes. Shake him, Lord. Yes. Shake him from the his head to his feet. Shake him, Lord. And remove whatever is in bring his you're moving into his life. Remove any demonic power that he has got a hold over him. In the name of Jesus, we pray, your begotten son. That he said, whosoever believe in me will have everlasting life. Lord. And I pray, Lord, that his wife will intercede for him continually, without ceasing, because you said, pray without ceasing. And he said, pray out the wife that will make, will move his heart, Lord, because if she stop praying continually in the house, continually, and, and just proclaim your scriptures, that's what she has to do, Lord, proclaim your scriptures. Because you said that you will move into the house. Amen. Where, where your presence abides, the house belongs to you. And we all belong to you, Lord. I pray for these men, Lord, that tonight he will move from the caravan and come up here and say, What are you doing there? Why are you singing? Let's hear our voices loud and clear that we say, The Lord Jesus Christ is the Lord, our God. Is the Lord all over the earth? Thank you, Lord. Thank
some time. And I saw paganism as I had never seen it before. And if we pray for the Lord to shake an individual, how much more we must be willing for him to shake a nation. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes, thank you. So are we going to be willing to be a part of being shaken. Yes. Mm. Because that might be rather unpleasant. Mm. Mm. And the Bible does say that we shouldn't shrink <coughs> from the person <coughs> of the Lord. Mm. So can we pray that? That he will so shake this nation mm. The people will be shaken back to Almighty God, Amen. to the God of their fathers, to the God to whom they committed themselves when the, uh, the Queen was crowned uh, years and years ago. Can we commit ourselves to the impossible unpleasantness of the time immediately ahead? And yet believe that during that time we shall have wonderful opportunities mm. to lead people to Praise the Lord. Praise God. Would there be somebody who could lead us in prayer of that? Father, you said that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And Lord, you said, um, ask the Father to send our workers into this harvest field. Mm -hmm. Father, we um, tonight are praying for these people that we believe are going to be um, coming to the kingdom through the shaking that you're going to bring on in the earth, and particularly in this country. And we ask, Father, that you bring out more workers for your kingdom, because when the harvest comes out, we believe it's going to be a mighty harvest. It's the end time harvest, and we do believe it's going to be a mighty one. So we ask you, please, to um, prepare us and those like us, those that believe in you, and bring out more workers into your harvest field, but prepare us to be ready by the power of the Holy Spirit to have the gift of discernment, to know when people are ready, and to be able to lead them to the Lord, and to be able to um, share the good news with them, Lord, and to be able to be there for them when all their troubles come upon them, because they will be shaking. There's going to be many troubles, and people are going to be really frightened and afraid, and everything. So we just pray, Father, that you will enable us to be there and ready for them and you will be preparing us to be there to um, be workers in your harvest field. But we also ask you please to send out more workers into this harvest field, getting more people ready. So we can be there for you at the end of the age because Jesus said, when I come, will I find faith on the earth? And we pray that you will find faith. You will find faith in us, Lord Jesus, that we will be ready and willing and workers ready to bring in the kingdom yeah. for you, Lord Jesus. Let's bring in the harvest. Amen. Yes. Amen. 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 Amen.
<laughs> Could we realize well, that actually it is the Lord Jesus himself who is building his church? Yes. 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 And that all we need to do is to trust him and do the next thing yes. while we're waiting for looking around for other people or for opportunities or whatever it may be. We are frankly diverted. Yes. Our attention has been moment by moment by him. Yes. Here we are, all people who love the Lord, we wouldn't be here otherwise. Here we have ministries. Now, what are these ministries? These ministries are already proven ministries. You see, people nowadays don't go about calling themselves apostles and introducing them. Actually, in some countries they do. Somebody said to me, I'm an apostle. I don't know what to say to him. <laughs> but some people, of course, are apostles. And they've got a proper ministry. Others are evangelists. They have a proper ministry. And nobody needs to pretend to be anything but what they are at the moment. God is building into them yes. individually, just where they are, mm. as long as they care that people get saved, yes. and as long as they seek to do what God is telling them to do mm. at the moment. Yes. Now we are privileged to have Brother Peter's God because he has an apostolic ministry. Mm. Yes. He has seen churches come into being through his ministry. Mm. He has seen churches destroyed <laughs> because the violence of Africa is something we know nothing about at present. And he has seen those churches, their descendants, come into being again as churches. It's like that. And we don't need to invent the ministries, we just need to recognize them mm -hmm. and appreciate them yeah. and understand what God is doing and relate to them. Mm -hmm. And praise the Lord. We've had two wonderful evenings here, and now we're going to have another. Mm -hmm. And hallelujah, then we're going all to go off. But God is building his church. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Shall we say one more hymn? And then, then Brother Peter. Praise the Lord. <laughs>
Lord. Hallelujah. That was the choir practice, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Glory. Bless you. So we sit. Amen. Let us, uh, uh, dear Lord, just lead us and guide us by your mighty Holy Spirit throughout the evening and let this be a memorable time in your presence that will leave an impact upon our hearts and minds in the future days. And I'm sure we say amen to that. Amen. I'm sure we do, yes. But something that Anne said a little moment ago sparked off, um, where well, it was like a fuse burning in my heart, and I'm just ready now for the explosion. <laughs> <laughs> Glory to God. Uh, remember what she said, she was talking about the shaking, the shaking. So let's just add a little to that, there'll be a shaking before the taking. Are you with me? There'll be a shaking before the taking. And I'm going to explain that first before we sing again. Great. Um, it's good to know what lies immediately in the future. And uh, you had a foretaste of this on the headlines of the media, I think it was yesterday. You're going to have to pay another 50% more for your loaf of bread very soon. Did you know that? The whole wheat prices are soaring through the roof. Now this is nothing new. Jesus predicted this 2,000 years ago. Yeah. So I'm going to turn your attention to this before I explain about the shaking and the taking. Mm -hmm. Oh, bless the Lord. So turn with me to Revelation chapter 6. And don't forget that the book of the Revelation is a revelation of our Lord Jesus himself. Not as some uh, can honestly say that it's uh, John's revelation. It is not the revelation of St. John. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ that was put into our hands to understand by John when it was reported. Let me just give you a little outline of this. As I say, we shall have a good song in a moment and a good scene. We must go back to Daniel 12, but without turning back to that, let me remind you that in Daniel chapter 10, Daniel the prophet of the Lord, the beloved of the Lord, so precious to God was Daniel, that the Lord said to him, now look, I'm going to a fast of 21 days. And it doesn't hurt you to go into a fast if God tells you to do it. Is that right? Yeah. Praise the Lord. And so Daniel went into a fast and would not eat the king's meat, but just had the minimum that was required to keep him uh, strong and well. And he fasted and prayed for 21 days, and then he encountered this amazing vision. And uh, the vision, the sum total of it was this, that God told Daniel that he would send his book, his record, his future record, his prediction down from heaven, and Daniel would be able to read it and understand what was to be said his people at the time of the end. So we have a time here in the book of Daniel, the time of the end. So let's just look what he's meant by the time of the end. God is working to a seven days week of divine purpose with the human race. We start way back in the early chapters of Genesis. From, say, as far as we have dating of Adam's age, and he lived 930 years. I don't know what we would look like if we were heading for 930 years. My, my. I think you'd scrap all the mirrors in the house to start with. <laughs> Praise God. And um, if, if you date from... Uh, now, we're not sure when Adam's dating began. Uh, I would propose it was at the time of his disobedience, the time of his fall, because God had said, in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And uh, Adam and Eve partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which they were forbidden to take. So I'm sure the timing began about that point in Adam's experience. 
And if you take that time in and clock off the 930 years, which is very interesting because it takes Adam almost to the first thousand year marker, doesn't it? And then just into the second period, that's the beginning of the second thousand years, Nor was born in the year 1056. Meanwhile, an amazing event happened between those dates when Enoch walked with God and was not because the Lord took him. And I want to be a was not, do you? <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. That the Lord take us into his presence, which uh, I'll touch in a moment. But then if we consider that and we go on, we find that there is a, a period of 4,000 years in approximation, but it's quite close to it, between the, the uh, Adam, as I say, at the timing, and the appearance of the Lord Jesus. Um, he was promised to be the seed of a woman, and he was the seed of Mary, as well as, of course, the divine seed of God. And um, we now find ourselves with a further 2,000 years from Christ till now, which really uh, allows for the first 6,000 years from Adam through to where we are today, 6,000 years of uh, elapsed. Now, Peter was very intrigued about all this sort of thing, and he would ask Jesus questions that we probably would have asked him if we had, he had been available to us in that sense. And this was after the resurrection, and Peter said to our dear Lord, he said, now come on, what was this timing that Daniel talked about, and the time of the end? And uh, the Lord gave him a very satisfactory answer. He said, look, uh, be not ignorant. I like the way Peter puts this. Be not ignorant. And I say this to you tonight. Be not ignorant of this one thing. Now that's a very outstanding statement, isn't it? And it's in 2 Peter 3 verse 8. Be not ignorant of this one thing. That a day with the Lord is to be counted as 1,000 years. Okay. So... When we're talking about the seven day time scale, that's the seven days in each week which God allocated in Genesis 1, then we are now at the end of 6,000 years. And indeed, we are at the end of 6,000 years in the timing, if you have the time to just check carefully through the scriptures. I spent three years on this, and uh, I tell you, it, it, it was intriguing. Right, so and another thing I want to add is this, that in the days of Jesus, the days began, I mentioned this earlier, but the days began at 6 o'clock in the evening, okay? And uh, yet Jesus, 2,000 years ago, talked about the midnight hour, which I think is remarkable, because our days begin at midnight. And uh, the, the story of the uh, of the ten virgins or the ten bridesmaids all hinges in its uh, great challenge around the midnight hour. And so we can see that Jesus knew 2,000 years ago that the timing situation as far as we're concerned would change from 6 o'clock in the evening until midnight, the big beginning of a new day. Right, so we're bang on with this now and I trust that you'll know that. And what I want to share with you very, very briefly before we sing again, because we're going to take a song about the coming of the Lord, is this, that um, God has set out very clearly, and Jesus has also, the events that will come uh, in rapid succession at the time of the end, so there will be no mistaking it. Now, if we're going to talk to Jesus and say, Lord, like the disciples did on the Mount of Olives, when Jesus had forecast and predicted the destruction of the temple, now that had shaken the disciples. They could never conceive how this beautiful temple, although it had been constructed by Herod the Great, it was for the Jewish people, and they could never really comprehend the idea of it being completely destroyed. But it was the unique way in which Jesus predicted it would be destroyed. He said, you see that building over there? 
there shall not be left one stone standing upon another that shall not be thrown down. Right, so just imagine you've got a property and you're going to remove it stone by stone from the top to the bottom and you're going to throw the stones down one after the other because that's what it suggests. And that is exactly what happened to the temple of God, the temple of the Lord, uh, when of course it was besieged by the Roman armies and by Titus, who was a general in the Roman army at that time. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, in the final stages, they tried to fire the temple because they were frustrated they could not find the treasures that they were seeking to discover. And they never did find them, of course, because they were to lay buried underneath the temple site until some hundreds of years later. Right. So there we have the picture. Now, the signs that Jesus gave are outlined in Matthew 24, Luke chapter 21, and Mark chapter 13. And they all tally if you compare them. And they're all in the same order if you compare them, which is most remarkable. And so they're set out clearly by our Lord. And I'm going to remind you very quickly what they were. His first emphasis, when he was talking about the signs of his coming, and we're talking about his coming, let's remember this, and we talk about the second coming, because there's a third coming as well, don't forget, we never hear much about the third coming, but you will tonight, but the second coming is when Christ comes for his blood-washed saints, okay? And that's reported in detail in Revelation chapter 7. And then he's coming seven years later. Notice all the seven years. Or if we get onto numbers again. Seven years later he's coming with his saints, with his holy angels, and with Michael the archangel, of course, to do battle with the evil that will remain on the earth and will have been built up it to intensity uh, after the seven year period. And that is reported in, uh, in partial detail in Revelation 19. But the full detail, believe it or not, you have to go back to the Old Testament to Zechariah chapter 14. Now because this is being recorded tonight, you don't have to worry about writing everything down. All you do is ask for the disc and then you can sit at home and hear it through stage by stage. Right. Now, what is going to happen is as follows. When Daniel received the book, from the Lord God that foretold two very important periods date-wise. And again, so few Christians have really understood this. The first section date-wise was to tell you when Christ would come the first time and lay down his life for the transgressions of the people. And he was bang on time. So I can tell you, if Daniel was so accurate with the first coming, date-wise, he will be just as accurate with the second coming date-wise. Amen. Now he spells out the second coming date-wise in Daniel chapter 12, which are the last five verses of the last chapter of Daniel in the book of Daniel. Okay. Now I haven't got time to go through this, but I guess you'd be very intrigued to know. Put your hands up if you'd like to know. Right. Can you give them the sheets there? You have the sheets. That is the largest of the A4 sheet that we've been given tonight. All the dates are on there. You take them home and you study them carefully. And if you want to know more, we'll provide you with the DVDs and the CDs that give you a full explanation. The three main dates on there are when the sacrifice ceases, 607 BC, then when the abomination of the desolation is set up, which means to build, to construct, so it's going to be a building, and it's the Mosque of Omer that was set up 12, 90 years later on the temple site where the Solomon Temple had stood before it was destroyed in AD 70, right? So Daniel was absolutely bang on with that. 
And then he said, blessed are they who live 13, 35 years later, and that date is 2019 AD. You have to take the paper home and study it carefully, and Daniel is telling you loud and clear when this great event will take place. Okay, now that's nothing to do with me or my interpretation. I'm simply quoting what Daniel said. And Jesus quoted Daniel, as we shall see in a moment, when he goes on to give further explanation. Right. Now the final stage was that having read the book, which contained the future of, uh, of Israel in particular, because that was what Daniel asked for, my people Israel, and don't start confusing Israel with the Jews and the Jews with Israel. Let's get all that clear right away at the beginning tonight. All Jews, which comprise of just two tribes of the original twelve, comprise of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. Right. Now all Jews are Israelites, of course, but not all Israelites are Jews. So you've got to get that clear in your thinking. When the Lord Jesus came, because this evolved much earlier, of course, it was first predicted by Harjah the prophet. Let me just tell you about Harjah. I didn't need to go into all these details, but some of this is not on record, so it'd be good for me to share it with you a bit extra. Uh, Harjah the prophet is a very godly man and who walked with God. And one day the Lord spoke to Harjah and he said to him, Look, a tremendous event is going to take place in Israel. And Israel is going to be divided into two nations. So I want you to go and buy a new prophet's garment. So he went, got measured up, and came back with his new garment. He looked very smart. It was all new, bright and shining garment, as you might say. And the Lord said, go and stand that field over there. I've marked that field over there. I want you to go and stand there. So he went and stood there. And he says, what next, Lord? He says, now take the garment off. And I want you to tear it into 12 pieces. Well, I've only just bought it, Lord. I've only just put it on and I look very smart in it. You're asking me to tear it up into twelve. Do as you're told. Do as you're told, Arjan. No, I wouldn't. Just get on with the job. Is that right? Is that what God expects us to do? No arguing and nattering and talking. Get on with the job. Amen. If he's given you a job to do, get on with it. Praise the Lord. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Oh, hallelujah. So our job tore his garment up, and the Lord said, put two on the right side and ten on the left side. And that is how the nation will be divided. The two tribes, of course, with the two pieces of the garment on one side, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. That's all explained in the book of Ezra. Go through the book of Ezra, and you'll understand everything I'm telling you tonight. You'll find that first, I think it's up to about the twelfth chapter, reference to the two tribes is loud and clear, uh, uh, the two tribes are mentioned, Judah and Benjamin. And then suddenly the word Jew appears as a substitute for the two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. And of course the term Jew is simply a shortened term of the two tribes. And uh, just like the word Brit, of course, which is used commonly in the, on the continent about us, is short for British. Isn't it? So that was understand. And, and when we get to heaven, if old Shakespeare's up there, I shall have a good old natter with him about all this, because he promoted this, uh, the new nickname more than any writer in the UK for a while, because he brought in Shylock the Jew in the Merchant of Venice, didn't he? And that was being enacted all over the country in a play form. No mind, we'll forgive him, shall we? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Right, so... Uh, we get this situation arising that Jesus comes along and he makes it very clear to his generation that the two nations still exist separately. Right, I'll just remind you very quickly of some of the scriptures. For example, our Lord's uh, sister was about to marry Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee in John chapter 2. And... Um, what did Jesus say about Nathaniel? An Israelite indeed in whom there is no guile. Is that correct? So he said, Nathaniel is an Israelite, as distinct from a Jew. 
And yet when Jesus was going down into Jerusalem, which was part of Judea, where the Jews were, of course, the disciples said, you must not go into Jewry. They seek your life and they seek to kill you. Right. And of course, in the 12 disciples, there was only one Jew and the rest were Israelites or Galileans from the north, well north. And that was Judas Iscariot, poor old Judas. But he had never been born, says the scripture, but he was. And uh, it was Judas who was responsible for betraying Jesus, if you remember. But these are all interests. And let me just add one other thing. You must pray for the Jews. Uh, and uh, You must pray for them. For the simple reason is they were caught up in this web of conspiracy by the religious, uh, 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 religious company of Judaism. And it all goes back to the day Jesus was crucified. For what did they cry out? Away with him, crucify him. His blood be upon us and our children. And that's why the Jews have suffered for 2,000 years. Did you know that? Because they invoked the curse of God upon themselves. But that curse is soon to be lifted to total. Praise the Lord. Because the scripture spells out exactly how long they have to bear it. And it's almost over. And you know when it's over? When we're on our way up to glory. Amen. I'll explain that, shall I? Right, anyway, but we'll go through those signs. First of all, there will be many Christ deceivers and many false religions that will border close on Christianity, but will not be the genuine thing. Many shall come in my name saying, I'm Christian, or this is Christian, and that is Christian and Christ deceivers and false prophets and so on. Now how strange that Jesus put that first. And when we come then to the chapter 6 of the book of the Revelation where we're told about the six seals, you see Daniel had to seal the book when he was given, uh, had given his attention to it and it had to be returned back to God, back to heaven, but not until Daniel had sealed it. And he sealed the book with, believe it or not, seven seals. <laughs> and in Revelation chapter 6, you read there what the six seals were about. Now, what you have to do, and I haven't got time to go into all this, but if you study the signs in the books I've mentioned, Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13, you'll find there are six major signs. And those six major signs blend and identify with the six seals in Revelation chapter 6. Okay, so then if you read them together, then you'll understand what the seals are all about. It's no mystery once you, once you do that, because scripture bears witness with scripture. And, after, and it's the sixth seal, the last of those seals, that is now something we have to think seriously about. Because that is the great shaking. Now let me explain something to you as well. Right. I, I was thinking the other day when we got the news from Pakistan about the great flood sort of absolutely turned that country upside down. And they're not the first. It's an ongoing thing is this out in East India just three weeks ago. They had floods on the, on the same, not quite so widespread, but shocking floods, I know, because I'm working out there. And um, at least one million people were displaced by those floods about, what, three, four weeks ago. And I've got photographs of terrible scenes. And then we only have to go back to 2004 Boxing Day for the tsunami that hit the Bay of Bengal because I have some of my churches on that Bay Area and I've been out there to see the devastating effect. My folk rescued 67 kids and that was all that was left, left of a whole fishing village and, and one or two villages actually. And they thought that the kids were drowned but they got their bodies out to give them a funeral and they, they found as they lifted them out, they, they started breathing again. I believe that many of those children were raised back to life again. I do. And they're in my, our orphanage now at Bihabra, 
and there's about 170 of, of them all together. And uh, they're alive and well today. Uh, in fact, I don't know whether we, we've got the Indian, yes, we've got one or two of the Indian Crusade DVDs there, and they're taking part on our platform uh, before we begin the ministry. And they're full of life, and I think they were floating about on the tsunami waters in 2004, presumed drowned. But God is good, isn't he? Yeah, praise the Lord, he is good. So, right, uh, let's go through this. You've got your six seals. They're being taken from the book. Now, at first, when this was proposed in heaven, there was no one found worthy to open the seals of the book. Until a cry went up, yes, there is someone worthy. The line of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed to open the seals of the book. <coughs> Who is that? That's Jesus, of course. Amen. And Jesus then has the responsibility of opening the seals. And you might say that the seal opening could have well be done 2,000 years ago. Because there's always been, with little commas around it, antichrists. Is that right? Yeah. They were in action in those days, and so on and so on. You get Pergamos with the Nicolaitan doctrines and things like that. So they were there. But Revelation chapter 5 verse 1 is another key verse to look at. Because this is what it says. And I saw in the right hand of him that sits upon the throne a book sealed with seven seals, written within and on the back side and so on. And that is the same book that was brought down to Daniel in Daniel chapter 10. It's the same book. And it's the same book that was sealed by Daniel the prophet. He put the seven seals on the book. And Revelation chapter 6 is the opening of the first six of those seven seals. Now we've got it clear. I'll try to make it as simple as I can tonight. Okay, right. Now, if you go through the seals and through the signs, you'll find when you come to the sixth seal, no, at no time in human history, listen, has there been what the sixth seal predicts. It has yet to happen. And what it is, is a great global earthquake. A great global earthquake. He describes it accurately there. That Remember, that's just the prediction of Jesus. It's not the apostles or anybody else. It's what Jesus is telling you is going to happen. Okay. And uh, you, you read the last of the opening of the seals of Revelation 6. It's a great global earthquake that's going to affect, listen, every mountain. Mm -hmm. And it's going to affect every island. Yeah. And that includes the British Isles. It's going to affect everywhere. Now at this moment, and I've been following this with very keen interest, because we're interested in the plutonic plates and the seismologist reports, and they tell us that all the plates worldwide are now being loosened. They're being loosened. Those under these great seas like the Pacific and the Atlantic are being loosened. And we've had a series of quakes in this last 12 months the likes we've never had before. And a lot of those have been under the oceans. And uh, one begins to wonder whether the whole of the problem in the Gulf of Mexico uh, was the result of an underground quake. Uh, and they had one under the Indian Ocean about three weeks ago, which was measuring nearly eight points on the Richter scale. But it's happening. And then one begins to wonder whether that has caused the events to happen in Iceland, where the volcano, three smaller volcanoes have exploded. But the latest news we have is this, that the large gigantic volcano in Iceland is about to blow its top. And when it does, in fact there was a report in the paper just yesterday to say if that happens, Maybe for the next five years, we should never have a summer. Now, what about that? Because the atmosphere, the ionosphere, will be so thick with debris from the earth that the sun will be watered out. Just not completely, of course, but sufficient to cause such a calamity. Now, all these are things that 
are sounding very negative, but they're very positive, really, because at least we have a warning. We're being told of these things right now, and I'm following them very carefully. So there's your shaking. Uh, this, uh, Isaiah says, this world will be like a drunken man when all this begins to happen. Amen. It's going to be a real old shaking. And uh, that's laying aside the great quakes we've had over the last 10 or 15 years. And they, they've been severe. And I, I'm expecting another one any time now. We've had four major quakes in the world already this year. In fact, uh, more than that, of course. But they're the ones that have hit the headlines of the papers. And of course, if there's a big quake in South America tomorrow, you might not even hear about it. Because the media are not interested in letting you hear something that happened again and happened again and happened again. All they're interested in is, is something sensational and new, as you probably know, to, uh, to stir, stir you up. Right, now, there's your shaking, and it's going to occur. Right. Can I just say one final thing on this? The New Testament record tells of a number of earthquakes, which are quite independent of what we're talking about tonight, although that's one of them that is included. Do you know when Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago? Do you know there was a great earthquake? Oh, there was. Three amazing events took place which identify with the crucifixion. One was that the veil in the temple that separated the holy place from the holy of holies was split from top to bottom by the finger of God. And then Paul, when he refers to this in his later epistles, said that uh, that depicts the, that through the flesh of Jesus, through him dying on the cross and bearing our sins, it means we have access into the Holy of Holies. Which I think is a very precious way of putting it, don't you? But not only that, there's this great earthquake, but simultaneously, many bodies of Old Testament saints came out of their graves so we have a wholesale resurrection in Matthew 27. And he doesn't say half a dozen here and a few down the corner there and a few on the other side of the road there. It says many, and it, remember what it says, bodies. We're not talking about spirits being resurrected up and all that sort of thing. We're talking about human bodies coming out of their graves. They had to be new bodies, glorified bodies. Amen. And they blend in, of course, with the feast situation, and that would be included in the feast of the first fruits. Praise the Lord. And that happened 2,000 years ago. So, if you now go through the New Testament, you'll find wherever there's an earthquake, there's a resurrection. No matter where it's mentioned, and I've been through them all. I'll just lift one out of random Revelation chapter 11. The two witnesses that bore testimony after the church had gone for three and a half years. And God supernaturally preserves them. And don't for heaven's sake ask me, who, who's the two witnesses? The Bible doesn't say. Uh, you can surmise and make suggestions, that's up to you. But there will be two witnesses. And they will preach the gospel. And they will preach it in the city of Jerusalem. They'll be hated by the inhabitants of the city. And their tempers will so boil up that eventually God will allow them to be martyred. They're killed in the streets of Jerusalem where they give their witnessing. So there were street preachers. Are you ready, boys? There were street preachers, these two. And uh, eventually they were slain. And they had such a disrespect for these two godly witnesses witnessing the gospel that they would not bury their bodies. This is what's in the scriptures. Jesus, this is Jesus predicting all this so you can understand what's going to take place. And uh, I've often thought, there can't be many hungry dogs about uh, that need to mold in three and a half days, wouldn't they? Anyway, they, they were not martyred and uh, 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 offended like that. But on the third day, after three and a half days actually, what happens? There's a great earthquake. Praise the Lord. And do you know what the earthquake does? And these are our Lord's predictions, I keep telling you. One tenth of the city of Jerusalem will come crashing down. 
My, that's going to be a good old quake, isn't it? One tenth of the city will be destroyed. Seven thousand people will die in that quake. Now fancy Jesus putting a number on it two thousand years ago. Will it, uh, will it happen? Yes. Of course it will happen because he's predicting it. Is that true? Did he tell the third day I'll come alive again? Yeah. Come on, answer me. Did he tell yeah. the third day I'll come alive yeah. again? Yeah. Did he come alive on yeah. the third day? Yeah. Yeah. Right, so the city. Of course, I believe it will be the new city. There's two Jerusalems out there. There's what we call the old city and the new city, of course. But it's with the old city. The Lord will not touch his, uh, touch his city now because the city that now exists, uh, Salem, as we might say, is the Lord's city. Uh, he built it. Did you, did you know who built Salem? Who built what we call Jerusalem today? Who built Jerusalem? Oh. Yes, of course he did. And the angels came to help him. And uh, it's called the city of God in Jeremiah. And it is God's city. So he holds the title deeds to it. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course he does. So we'll be tired beside anybody who now begins to, to touch it because that's what will bring to head the final conflict between good and evil. Right. So, have you got the picture now? It's all there. Now, the last seal to be opened, the others have been opened. And if I went through them tonight, you'd say, well, that happened. Yes, that happened. History tells us this, that, and the other. But nowhere have we got a record of a great global earthquake that affects every nation, every land, every mountain, and so on. No, we haven't got that. But it's coming. And all the plates are now being loosened, ready for the Big Bang. Now that's the shaking. It's going to shake the world. Now when that begins to take place, I wonder when the flood scale in Pakistan, I mean, you listen to what I'm saying, I wonder when this happened in the last few hours or two or three days, I wonder how many folk prayed for the first time. Mm -hmm. How about that? Mm -hmm. I wonder how many folk got down on their knees and called upon the name of the Lord. Allah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you with me? Yeah. I wonder how many rushed into the mosque and called upon Allah. Come and help us. Come and do something for us. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And I might go a bit further. How many ran into, if they, were, if they were in the area where there was a Christian church, how many Christians ran into the church if it was still standing, if it had not been washed away, and they started to ask the Lord, come and help us and so on. Can you imagine what will happen when a great global earthquake hits the earth? My, my. Do you think people will pray? Do you think they'll call on God? Well, that is what we're talking about tonight and what Sister Anne's talking about. A calling upon God out of fear, out of terror. Because they won't call upon God out of conviction. Because they don't want conviction. And so there will be a wholesale salvation. I mean, if God could extend his saving grace to a thief on the cross three hours before he had his legs broken and, and he died, God will extend his grace to those who call on his name in the last hour. Amen. We shall never know till we get to heaven and hear testimonies up there in the glory of folk who called in the last hour of their existence on earth to be saved. Is that correct? Now are you with me with this now? Do you understand what I'm saying? So I set the future out, the immediate future. And what happens then? This is what you need to do now. You need to read <coughs> Revelation chapter 6. Go through... Oh, there's another aspect of this I want to mention. Let's just turn this over with me because this is something that I just want to point out. Because every day something is happening. And verse 6, you see the black horse, which was the third of the seals, a black horse, I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny, three measures of barley for a penny, and see that thou hurt not the oil and the wine. If you want to calculate that uh, in the terms that it was written in those days, 
What it works out is that you'll have to pay a pound at least for a small loaf of bread. Have we got to that point yet? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Who's paid more than a pound for a loaf of bread? Yeah. Well, you jolly well going to do soon because it's going up 50%. <laughs> okay? Don't you think that that is the fulfillment of this prediction that you're reading in the book of the Revelation, chapter 6? <coughs> Can't have it much clearer than that. Well, let, let me help you to make comparison. I remember going down to the cooperative, my mum said, go and fetch me a loaf of bread. And I went, and I took four pence halfpenny with me. How many of you can remember when you could buy a loaf of bread for four pence halfpenny? Come on. <laughs> yes, my friend. <laughs> and do you know how many pence were in a pound in those days? 240 pence.